Good morning and good afternoon, and thank you for joining Baker Hostetler's CLE webinar today, The Failing Firm Antitrust Defense, How to Navigate Financially Troubled Mergers During a Pandemic. My name is Carl Hittinger. Uh, I am the National Practice Team Leader for Baker Hostetler's Antitrust and Competition Team. I will be the moderator for this webinar today. A couple of housekeeping things before we introduce our speakers and get going with our program. This program lasts about an hour today. It's approved for CLA credit in California, New York, Pennsylvania, and Texas. And it's available for reciprocity in New Jersey as well. Uh, credit is pending in Colorado, Florida, Georgia, Illinois, Ohio, Virginia, and Washington. For all of the states, the uh, attorneys can receive a certificate of attendance and electronic materials can uh, be uh, filed directly with the CLA crediting authorities. Uh, during the course of this webinar, you'll see uh, we'll share two codes you'll need to enter into your brief uh, CLE questionnaire immediately after the program's, program's conclusion. Uh, once the webinar is ended, please uh, look for a small pop-up on your screen. Click close for your CLE quiz to appear in your browser and make sure to answer all questions you'd like to submit for CLE credit. Now, if you have any questions during the presentation, you can type your questions in the bar on the side of your screen. Uh, we'll try our best to answer them at the end if we have enough time remaining. Uh, if not, there's always an opportunity to follow up with any of the presenters on any questions you might have, so feel free to do that. Uh, we'll provide contact information at the end of the program as to all the presenters, and we'll, we welcome any comments or suggestions or, or questions that you might have. Um, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Uh, Mark Shieldcrowd is a, is a partner in our Washington office. Uh, he's uh, an antitrust lawyer. Uh, he will be speaking briefly first, and then we'll introduce a little bit more in more detail later. Uh, we also have with us today Baker Hostetler partner, uh, Mike Van Neel. Uh, he is in our Cleveland office, and he is a bankruptcy and commercial law a lawyer. Uh, also joining us today is Dan Foy. Dan is a, a partner in our Washington office, and Dan specializes in antitrust matters as well. And finally, we have a member of our uh, corporate group uh, specializing in mergers and acquisitions, and his name is Ryan Gorsh, and he'll be speaking today. He's in our Dallas office, our new Dallas office, uh, by the way. So today's uh, uh, webinar is gonna be dealing with some cutting edge issues that are uh, emerging out of this pandemic as uh, mergers and acquisitions start reoccurring again. These issues that we're going to discuss today are going to come into full play as they have in the past. So we're fortunate today to have some really experienced people who have dealt with these issues in the past, not just the antitrust lawyers, but bankruptcy and mergers and acquisition lawyers. So you're going to have a little different perspective all over the map. And again, feel free to ask your questions. The first uh, presenter is going to be Mark Shieldcrab. And again, Mark uh, is in our DC office. He's formerly with the uh, FTC, he was the assistant director of competition there. Uh, and he is a very experienced uh, antitrust lawyer handling a variety of mergers and acquisitions over the years in all sorts of areas. Mark. Thank you. So, as a result of the pandemic, firms suffering significant financial hardships may decide that a merger or an acquisition is the only way to survive. Our presentation today will navigate its way through the antitrust waters when one of the firms to the merger is failing or flailing. Our bottom line, which I am telling you now, is that while the antitrust agencies indicate that merger parties must strictly comply with the failing firm defense, there is the potential for a more flexible response than their words suggest. After laying out all these antitrust considerations, we conclude with some negotiating tips regarding the purchase and sale agreement but we begin by turning the presentation over to Mike to tell you about uh, bankruptcy proceedings that will serve as a platform for our discussion of HSR notifications. Mike. Thank you, Mark, and thanks to all the attendees for participating today. Um, as we pulled this uh, presentation together, we thought it might be a good idea, just given the context of some of the decisions and opinions and, and things that are going to be discussed later on, if I provided the, the group with what I'd call base, some ba bankruptcy basics. Um, bankruptcy is a foreign arena uh, for most folks, um, including in the context of mergers and acquisitions activities. 
there are a lot of nuances and, and frankly it can be counterintuitive um, and move much more quickly than a lot of folks are typically comfortable with. So um, if you can move to the next slide, please. First thing I'll, I'll talk about just generally is the two types of bankruptcy proceedings that will typically come into play when these antitrust issues and HSR uh, notification issues might arise. Um, the first is chapter seven of, uh, of the bankruptcy code. This is what we refer to as, a, as just a straight asset liquid, liquidation. Um, in a chapter seven case, a panel trustee uh, from a local list of trustees in each jurisdiction uh, done by random draw is appointed to essentially marshal, collect, gather assets, liquidate them as expeditiously as possible, um, and then make distributions to uh, creditors, file, file reports, close the case, and, and, and off they go. Um, of particular note, a Chapter 7 trustee is not really authorized to operate an ongoing business, um, except in very exceptional circumstances, and those do occasionally arise, I think, in, including in a couple cases that are going to be discussed a little bit later on in the presentation. Um, but that's basically what a Chapter 7 case is. More often, uh, these, these sales and, and issues that would implicate the, the antitrust concerns would arise in the context of a Chapter 11 case. Um, a Chapter 11 is what we refer to as a reorganization case. And when I say reorganization, I put that in quotes. That can take many forms. It can include a going concern sale of an operating business. Um, it can include a whole host of things. And I, I'm fond of saying that really the Chapter 11 process is limited only by the creativity of the lawyers and other professionals that are running it. Um, in a Chapter 11 case, the, the company itself actually is, is the trustee. So it operates and manages the process itself. Um, there are, there's a lot of confusion sometimes in terms of terminology. When I, if you look at the slide, I, I, I reference true reorganization. That's what we would typically think of as a company goes in, files a plan, restructures its balance sheet, and emerges as a, as a going concern. Um, I think we're going to see more of those in the wake of the pandemic, just as companies try to do leverage. Uh, but more often, and, and more particularly for purposes of today's presentation, uh, we see what we refer to as liquidating Chapter 11 cases which are uh, cases in which the debtor company goes in, uh, preferably with a uh, proposed buyer in its hip pocket, files a, a, a case, uh, operates for a limited period uh, during the course of the Chapter 11 proceeding, and then concludes a sale of all or substantially all of its operating assets. Um, in a liquidating 11, what you end up with at the conclusion of a sale of the sort that I just described is typically the proceeds of that sale, if they are in excess at least of what's necessary to repay the bank or whatever other secured creditor might be out there, the pro excess proceeds would be dumped into a liquidating plan trust of some sort that would then carry out various administrative activities from there. Um, we can go to the next slide. So Section 363 sales, we hear a lot about those, and there's I've run into in my practice some confusion from folks about what those really are. Uh, simply put, they, uh, there's a specific section of the bankruptcy code, Section 363, that permits the sale of assets outside of the ordinary course of business uh, after notice and a hearing. Um, and it's this section that really is, is what we're talking about when we discuss uh, sales or mergers of uh, a debtor's operating business through the Chapter 11 process. Um, and as I note in the third bullet point on this slide, a 363 sale, just generally speaking, it colloquially refers to a sale that occurs and concludes outside the context of a confirmed Chapter 11 reorganization plan. And you'll hear a little later on in the presentation that there are, you can also implement these sorts of sales through a confirmed bankruptcy plan, uh, but that's a fairly uh, complicated process. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. 
So in this slide, um, I've, I've laid out just the basic statutory requirements for a 363 free and clear. And what that means is that the sale uh, would be approved by the bankruptcy court and whatever assets or business is being conveyed would be free and clear of any trailing liabilities, essentially of any kind, so long as one of these statutory requirements is met. Although there are a number listed in the statute as a practical matter, um, these transactions tend to proceed uh, on a consensual basis and tend to be driven by the senior secured uh, creditor uh, working hand in hand with the debtor to market and sell assets. Um, I would say, again, as a practical matter, that absent the consent of the applicable lien holders, um, you're, you're going to have a very difficult time carrying out a, a, what I would call a successful 363 sale. Um, I've laid out on, this, on the side of this slide some, again, just practical requirements. Um, in order to obtain approval of a 363 going concern sale, it's a very relaxed standard that bankruptcy courts use, business judgment standard, which should be familiar to anyone that's familiar with general corporate law, very deferential, um, so long as notice is appropriate and folks uh, who may have an interest in the proceeding have a, an opportunity to object to be heard. Uh, that's basically the, the procedural requirements. Um, and by and large, the highest and best bidder at the conclusion of a reasonable marketing effort will be approved by the court. So long as the, the buyer and the, the seller acted in good faith, there was no collusion, bid rigging, other types of bad acts. Um, we can go to the next slide. I thought it would be useful for the group, just when we talk about 363 sales, there's a, there's a pretty typical process that's tried and true that we in the bankruptcy arena use that lead to these transactions that will be discussed later on in the presentation. Um, I, the way these cases typically go is, is pre-bankruptcy, pre the debtor's obviously in some financial distress. The debtor will start working with restructuring advisors, which usually will, will include an investment banker of some sort. The banker will carry out a marketing effort uh, that will market test the business. And ideally a stalking horse buyer, somebody who wants to buy can be designated and then you can file bankruptcy with that person in hand. At that point, you would commence your chapter 11 case and right at the outset of the case, you would file two motions with the court. Uh, one is a motion to implement uh, bid and auction procedures and to designate, hopefully, a stalking horse buyer if you have one um, in place. And that person would be entitled to various protections because they've set the floor for the uh, for the sale. Uh, typical, I won't go through them all. Again, there there are, are many, but typically that that. The procedures motion will ask to set a breakup fee for the stalking horse bidder. Um, market is usually one to four percent, with some uh, additional expense reimbursement, maybe up to a cap. Uh, there will be for competing bidders to come in and try to uh, outbid that the, the stalking horse. There will be a minimum overbid requirement, which essentially prevents what what you know, the price is right type scenario where somebody bids $1 higher than the other person. Um, the procedures motion would also set deadlines for the submission of competing qualified bids, as well as other requirements that would need to be met uh, in order to be a quote unquote qualified bidder. Um, typically those types of requirements are things like no financing contingency associated with your proposed transaction, some sort of an earnest money deposit that would be refundable, proof of ability to close, and then likely a, uh, a red line marked up form of an APA that would be posted in a, in a data room by the uh, debtor company. If qualified competing bids are submitted, then the debtor would conduct an auction for the business and at the conclusion of that uh, would pick up a, a winning bidder that they would then present to the court for final approval. Um, assuming all the requirements are met, the sale is approved by the bankruptcy court through a 363 sale order. Uh, I would say that all of this would happen, at least prevailing trends are that it happens very, very fast. Uh, I like to tell clients that bankruptcy moves very fast. Not everybody's comfortable with that pace. Uh, 
but the bankruptcy courts and the professionals that operate in this arena are comfortable with that. Um, and once the sale order is entered at that point, the parties would then move forward to, uh, to, to attempt to close the transaction by whatever deadline is set. And it's really in the context of the efforts to close that you have things like the, the, the applicable HSR filings and, and things of that nature that, uh, that our folks are going to talk about. So with that, we can move to the next slide. You should uh, now enter your uh, CLE code for credit. And our next presenter, we're going back to Mark Fieldcrowd. And as you remember, Mark was uh, with the FTC. He's an extremely experienced uh, lawyer in the mergers and acquisitions area, both litigation and business advice and compliance. Mark? Thank you. So there are exceptions to the drawn out HSR process, even when the standard thresholds are met. First, an acquisition may not require HSR notification if, the if it is an acquisition of a defaulting creditor of, of collateral. Um, second, the waiting period on a 363B sale are shorter than the typical notification. Next slide. Um, the 363B transaction qualifies for a 15-day waiting period rather than 30 days. If the FTC issues a second request in the 15-day period, the second waiting period expires 10 days after substantial compliance rather than 30 days. Only the acquiring entity has to comply with the second request, not both parties. Next slide. The, uh, the, what this the FTC found itself in the 363B world when it investigated the proposed combination of Financial News Network and CNBC. I, I was actually the assistant director in charge of the matter at the FTC many years ago when this occurred. Uh, the FTC and uh, state AGs appealed to a district court concerning the bankruptcy court's jurisdiction over an FTC challenge to the acquisition. The district court held that the FTC's extensive involvement in the bankruptcy court proceeding provided implicit consent to the jurisdiction of the bankruptcy court. DOJ later in two matters did not get itself entangled with the bankruptcy court and was able to challenge those acquisitions in federal court. Next slide. So uh, changing subjects a little. Um, so. What are the standards used to determine whether a merger is anti-competitive? The, the standard applying to mergers is Section 7 of the Clayton Act, where the tribunal must focus on whether in the future the effects of the acquisition may be substantially to lessen competition or tend to create a monopoly. Next slide. The more specific standard we're addressing here is the failing firm defense. But uh, just but it's still section seven and it's all about the future. The fundamental question that have to, has to be answered is whether the, in the absence of the merger, the assets of the purported failing firm will exit the market. The requirement to meet the failing firm defense focuses on answers to this question. So let's look at these in more detail on the next slide. So, uh, the first criteria is about the inability to meet obligations. The criteria, this requires a close look at uh, past financial performance, such as cash flow, liabilities versus assets over time, and costs versus revenues. The second criteria is an inability to reorganize under, cha under Chapter 11, for example. The third criteria is whether there is a more competitive buyer available to buy the assets or company. This requires the failing firm to engage in a systematic search for a buyer. The failing firm, in, in fact, must accept a purchaser that is offering any price above a liquidation value. And that's not, that's not gonna be a happy event for uh, people trying to sell their assets. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, the most recent case highlighting the search for, for the buyer is United States v. Energy Solutions, a 2017 case. The market in the Energy Solutions case is low-level radioactive waste disposal services. Next slide. 
the DOJ sued to enjoin this 367 million merger, alleging that the merger would create a monopoly with the merge firm offering the only available low level radioactive waste disposal service in 36 states. The parties asserted a failing firm defense, arguing that waste control specialists, the target, was losing money and would likely shut down if the deal were blocked. The court rejected the party's defense, citing the merger agreement's no shop provision as evidence that there was not a good faith effort to find an alternative buyer. According to the court, defendants must show that WCS made good faith efforts to elicit reasonable alternative offers. Uh, the parent engaged in a single bidder process and then agreed to several deal protection devices that, that have made it impossible to entertain other offers. Next slide. In line with the outcome in Energy Solutions, on May 27th of this year, the director of the FTC's Bureau of Competition, Ian Connor, placed a post on the FTC blog about the failing firm defense. Mr. Connor stated that the Bureau rarely finds the facts supporting a failing firm defense. He further stated that the, that the firm better actually be failing and able to prove it. The tenor of his post was that the FTC was going to demand rigorous satisfaction of the failing firm criteria we've already discussed. Uh, Mr. Connor did not suggest that there were other options, so Let's talk about another option on the next slide. Alternative to the failing, uh, the, excuse me, the use of the failing firm defense does not require meeting all of the failing firm criteria. The defense focuses on the failing firm's future ability to compete, even if it does not go out of business. Uh, the failing firm defense originated in a Supreme Court case, U.S. v. General Dynamics. In that case, the acquired firm's ability to compete was questionable, where the acquired firm entity was a coal company that could not obtain coal reserves to continue competing. Next slide. Uh, one example of the use of the failing company defense was the FTC's investigation of Boeing and McDonnell Douglas. I, I represented McDonnell Douglas in that merger matter. There were two areas of competition where McDonnell Douglas and Boeing overlapped, jet fighters and commercial aircraft. In the jet fighter market, McDonnell Douglas had been eliminated from competition from the joint strike fighter program, and there really was nothing much else in the pipeline. In the commercial aircraft area, McDonnell Douglas was not able to sell its commercial aircraft with the exception of one sale the FTC accepted the argument that McDonnell Douglas was a flailing company and the acquisition would not be anti-competitive. Next slide. So what's the difference between a failing firm and a flailing firm? Th this is my take. A flailing firm, sometimes called the weakened competitor, is unlikely to be a significant future competitor. A failing firm might be a competitive presence in the future by reorganizing under Chapter 11 or selling itself to a firm outside of the market that could cover its financial obligation. So let's apply these differences to the Boeing McDonnell Douglas matter. Next slide. Uh, McDonnell Douglas was definitely not a failing firm. It could indefinitely sell its parts for, for the operation of existing aircraft in the market, but McDonnell Douglas could not offer significant competition to Boeing. Another acquirer could not have changed McDonnell Douglas' competitive destiny, and I think that's the most important point. Next slide. I also represented the buyers in two separate refinery acquisitions, which shed more light on how the FTC will look at a failing firm, and they're, they're both fairly recent. In both cases, we were able to convince the FTC that the refinery be acquired would close very soon if the acquisition were not consummated. In both cases, the seller did not shop the assets and hence did not meet the failing company defense. Nevertheless, in both cases, the FTC had allowed the acquisition to go forward. Uh, Dan will now be offering some additional examples of this. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. 
Let me introduce uh, Dan Foy. Dan is uh, our partner in our DC office. Dan has extensive experience in antitrust work, both uh, bringing antitrust cases, defending antitrust cases, and also compliance and business advice uh, involving antitrust issues for companies uh, around the country. So, Dan? Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Mark. Uh, you've seen how the FTC, DOJ, and courts over time have explained that the failing and, and the flailing firm defenses are to be uh, stringently applied and that they are to uh, be applied successfully in only rare cases. Uh, but the results of the reviews by enforcers and courts don't always match their explanation. I'll, I'll highlight a couple cases that illustrate when and how enforcers in the courts may be more flexible than they say. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, next slide also. Thank you. Uh, I'll begin with a failing firm example. Uh, a few years ago, the two largest doctor groups in central Minnesota agreed to a combination. Uh, it was, by the way, a, a non HSR reportable transaction. Now, the doctor group that was being acquired was having difficulty paying its bills and it had uh, tapped out its credit line. Uh, but even more, many of its doctors were planning to hit the door and some of them were planning to leave the uh, central Minnesota market. Apparently after the Minnesota AG started investigating, the FTC got involved and uh, reviewed the acquisition before it was completed. The FTC had some internal disagreement about whether the failing firm defense could apply here, uh, mostly because not enough doctors had yet left the group to jeopardize its continued existence. But recognizing that doctors were planning to leave, and that they were planning to leave the market, which would be um, especially bad for consumers because this is a relatively rural area. Uh, the FTC ultimately reached a very flexible solution uh, with the merging companies. It allowed the deal, it invoked the failing firm rationale, even though one or two commissioners uh, argued in, in a dissent that it didn't apply. And, and it did this with the party's agreement to release doctors who wanted to depart the group and with the acquiring firm providing incentives to keep those departing doctors in the market. Uh, the FTC explained that this was a practical way to respond to a maybe close to failing firm and that it was in in this circumstance the best way to preserve competition uh, in this market uh, next slide please uh, so next I have an example of a, a flailing firm uh, that was uh, reviewed with some flexibility and and this was in a, a recent uh, court case that probably most people have heard about. Uh, it's the bench trial on T-Mobile Sprint. Uh, the DOJ uh, had determined that that merger would increase market concentration in an amount that would was anti-competitive, uh, presumptively under the merger guidelines. Uh, in a bench trial on the challenge brought by state AGs, uh, T-Mobile Sprint sought to rebut that presumption by showing Sprint was a flailing firm. Uh, it wasn't obvious to many uh, observers that Sprint could satisfy or even had satisfied a stringent application of any of the failing or filling firm requirements. Uh, the evidence suggested that Sprint was not at risk of failing anytime soon. Uh, it 
it arguably faced challenges making network upgrades and keeping customers. But the court found that was largely because of mismanagement, uh, which, as Mark mentioned in an earlier slide, does not often uh, support uh, a finding for failing or failing firm. And there also wasn't a lot of evidence that Sprint had exhausted its options other than merging with T-Mobile. Uh, and I, as an aside, I'll point out that the party's arguments about failure or flailing uh, were inconsistent with Sprint's investor disclosures, uh, which forecast a pro <clears throat> profitable future and uh, an ability to upgrade its network. Uh, well, these types of contemporaneous documents can often control the analysis, and that's uh, a subject for another webinar probably. Uh, the court here gave more weight to the testifying experts and witnesses than the contemporaneous documents. Uh, the court concluded uh, in a very lengthy opinion that Sprint was what the court called a weakened competitor and that at uh, some point in the future, and it seemed to be pretty far into the future, uh, Sprint would not be able to continue as a meaningful competitor in a market that was uh, rapidly evolving into a 5G platform, and that would require uh, large infrastructure investments uh, to, to keep up with uh, Verizon and, and uh, AT&T. So the court's receptiveness to the defense uh, when uh, Sprint wasn't failing, and if it was flailing, it wasn't much at all, and that was probably because of mismanagement, uh, reflects uh, what I would call an elastic application of the uh, failing firm rationale. Uh, can move to the next slide, please? So the flexibility we've seen to this point uh, may increase in a time of a pandemic uh, and, and also in the context of bankruptcy. And, and this can be seen in the ongoing DFA, Dean Foods acquisition. Uh, Dean Foods and DFA, along with its joint ventures, have been among the largest bottlers of milk in the United States for, for, for many years. Uh, they reportedly began discussing a combination last year, but called it off. Uh, it's worth noting that in the past, the DOJ had investigated both companies on monopsony issues, uh, that is uh, their, their buying power for milk from farmers. And in the past, the DOJ had required divestitures and conduct terms uh, when those companies had made relatively small acquisitions. But in late 2019, Dean declared Chapter 11 bankruptcy, and the companies took a shot at a transaction. Uh, like you heard earlier, in the bankruptcy context, this happened really fast. Uh, there was a 363 bid process set by the court that lasted for 11 days. Uh, in that time, DFA, uh, which, which was the appointed uh, stocking horse, uh, DFA was the only bidder for most of Dean's assets. Uh, the bankruptcy court approved the transaction on April 5, and the DOJ cleared it on May 1, 2020. Uh, so the, the entire bid to clearance timeline was only six weeks, uh, which for an antitrust lawyer seems pretty fast, but I gather for a bankruptcy lawyer is, is sort of ordinary. Uh, so this uh, transaction, I think, illustrates the process flexibility when bankruptcy is involved and also uh, substantive flexibility in the bankruptcy and pandemic context. Uh, 
the, the parties in the DOJ reached an agreement, consent order, to allow the transaction with the divestiture of, of three facilities, which is a relatively small number of the assets that were acquired. In a press release, the DOJ highlighted the potential loss of jobs and complications from the pandemic if the uh, bankrupt assets weren't acquired very quickly. And uh, the DOJ did a quick review. Uh, and the, its analysis in the Tunney Act disclosures don't say anything about the monopsony issues, which, as I mentioned, had been the issue of concern for many years in prior transactions by these two same companies. Uh, so in summary, we've seen uh, in these examples that there's potential for flexible application to reach practical solutions involving failing firms or failing firms. And uh, in the time of pandemic, uh, there may even be the potential for even more flexibility and more creative solutions going forward. Okay, Mark. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you. So a we're in the middle of a pandemic. Traditional assessments take time. Traditional assessments take, in fact, a lot of time. It's, it's around a year at the FTC and DOJ on average, a little longer at the FTC than that. But a company that has lost most of its business all of a sudden does not have the luxury of time to satisfy, let alone prove, all of the failing firm requirements. And there may not be uh, many potential buyers given the nature of the crisis in any event. Next slide. So we hope that we have shown you that under proper circumstance or with proper advocacy, the agencies can be convinced to use common sense when considering a flailing or failing firm defense. The agencies may not insist on the merging firms meeting all of the shopping requirements if the only apparent alternative to the merger is the imminent exit from the market of the failing assets. Uh, the antitrust agencies can be convinced to consider the actual impact on competition, whether or not the boilerplate failing company criteria are met. That does not mean the parties to such a deal can relax. Not only do they need to marshal their defenses, they need to draft appropriate purchase and sale agreements. And that is our la next and last topic to, to next be addressed by Ryan. Next slide. At this point, please enter your code for uh, 456 for the CLE credit. I'd like to introduce our last speaker, which is Ryan Gorsh. Ryan is a, a partner in our Dallas office. Uh, he has extensive experience dealing with uh, complex mergers and acquisitions, particularly uh, joint ventures and divestitures and carve-outs and restructurings of all sorts. And so, Ryan, all yours. Thanks, Carl. I want to speak a bit about some practical purchase agreement considerations that the deal party should consider in the antitrust context generally and conclude with some specific considerations regarding the purchase agreement and deal process uh, if the failing or flailing firm defense may be relevant uh, to the deal at hand. Uh, so first, I, I want to speak about developing your negotiation strategy generally in, in any context. Uh, as many of you know, M&A transactions subject to antitrust approval and, and relatedly antitrust investigation and enforcement actions can generate significant risks for the parties. They may be minor, such as the paying of filing fees, uh, to the moderate delays in closing because of antitrust investigations, to the severe, including the required divestiture of overlapping business segments and assets, or worse, the failure to obtain approval. Now, absent risk-shifting provisions, the seller largely bears the antitrust risk and fallout if the transaction does not close. A buyer may miss out on the opportunity of acquiring the target, but following a deal announcement, a target is likely to experience losses from employees, customers, and vendors that terminate a relationship, from management that's distracted from the target's standalone strategy, and if there's a broken deal, the market perception that the target is damaged goods. Now, buyers may think that allocation is just fine, but few, if any, well-advised sellers will fully accept that risk. 
So the first step in any transaction is for the deal parties to work with their antitrust and deal counsel to determine the likely antitrust risk of the transaction. Negotiating the full suite of antitrust risk allocation provisions requires significant advisor costs, negotiating capital, and time. So if the antitrust risk is low, the return on investment may not be very high to negotiate these provisions. And the strategies and provisions I'm about to discuss are most relevant when the risk is elevated. I want to provide a short recap of how parties typically allocate these risks in any transaction, whether the failing or flailing firm defense is relevant or not. So the most common standards that you'll see are effort standards, and most of you are probably familiar with these standards. You'll see things like reasonable efforts or reasonable best efforts, best efforts or commercially reasonable efforts to uh, gain antitrust clearance. The one word of caution is that many parties think of these standards as having a very clear hierarchy. And if you ask most deal professionals, they'll tell you there is one. Best efforts is seen as the most demanding. Commercially reasonable efforts is usually seen as the least or one of the least demanding. But there are court cases in some jurisdictions that do not always track these hierarchies. And so your provision for your effort standard should also include specific requirements. For example, if you know that an HSR filing is required, the contract should say so. And additionally, you want to provide for specific timelines. Uh, you don't just rely on saying they're going to use commercially reasonable efforts to file the HSR filings. They'll say that it's in any event within 10 business days after signing. And the failure to meet these covenants can be a significant breach. There also will be filing fee allocation. Filing fees related to antitrust filings may not be particularly material, depending on the relative size of the transaction. The default position is the, acquirer pers the acquiring person pays the HSR filing fee. Nonetheless, you see very often people agreeing to split the fees 50-50, and even in some instances allocating the economic cost of the filing fee entirely to the seller. Additionally, you see cooperation provisions, and these are provisions that may be particularly relevant if you, like, if you intend to exercise the failing or flailing firm defense. So in transactions with elevated antitrust risk, approval may not be as simple as simply making the filing and waiting for expiration of the waiting period. There will likely be interaction with the antitrust authorities. And so it's important to spell out contractually how the parties intend to handle this. Deal parties will spell out which participants are allowed to meet, attend the meetings and when and how long and whether notice must be provided. They must, they'll also provide whether and what the parties may communicate with the antitrust authorities whether those communications must be provided in advance to the extent permitted by law, and whether one party must obtain consent of the other before communication. And these provisions also spell out who actually dictates and controls the strategy. Most often, the purchase agreement will provide the buyer seeks to control the strategy. And that includes everything from negotiations with the authorities, defense strategies, and determining whether to pursue litigation or make divestitures. And I'll describe some protective mechanisms shortly for divestitures and litigation. But the target party will often seek that the strategy be jointly managed, or that at a minimum, the target's views and comments will be considered in good faith. The target may also seek consent rights over certain actions or omissions that could affect the likelihood of obtaining antitrust clearance. Lastly, the parties may agree on who may extend or toll the HSR waiting periods. One party may wish to extend that period if they believe the regulator's concerns could be alleviated with more time uh, than thereby avoiding a second request. This is particularly germane in some of these distressed asset deals or distressed mergers where the, where the target may not have a lot of time to wait around. Finally, we have covenants on divestiture obligations and limitations. These are often one of the most contested provisions with the extent, and it, they control the extent the parties and really the buyer will divest assets to uh, grant, give approval, to grant approval. Often the buyers will seek to strongly limit their obligations. They don't have to divest anything. Sellers will try and seek the opposite. The buyer has to do everything requested. You sometimes hear that called a hell or high water provision. In the end, many parties in, in antitrust sensitive transactions will meet in the middle and craft what is often called a pain threshold. They may agree that certain specific assets are fair game for divestiture. They may also seek to define uh, those assets by some financial metric. So for example, assets that are valued below a specific dollar amount could be divested or that are not material to the business or assets the divestiture of which would not result in an MAE are all examples. And they may use some financial metric. The assets that are, that are divested generate revenue or EBITDA below a certain threshold. In the, op in the alternative, they may agree that some assets are simply off limits. The buyer essentially says they'll divest some things, but if they're asked to divest a crown jewel, they can refuse. Similarly, there are, there are covenants regarding litigation obligations and limitations. Parties will specify whether or not the parties are required to litigate and how much against the government. 
You also see covenants restricting pre-closing activities. Perfect example of this is if you have two competitors that are agreeing to combine, and after signing the transaction, the buyer also agrees to buy a third competitor, it materially increases the risk of the first deal. So in those situations, the covenant may restrict those sorts of activities of the buyer or the seller. Next slide, please. You also will find uh, breakup fees, and in this case, they're typically referred to as reverse breakup fees. So the sellers often seek that a buyer pay a termination fee to the seller target if the transaction does not close because of a failure to obtain approval or if there's an injunction against the transaction. This doesn't increase the likelihood of obtaining approval, of course, but it compensates the seller or the target for the risks, costs, and opportunity costs of pursuing a failed transaction. Reverse termination fees are often payable in other non-antitrust contexts as well. So the parties may negotiate two or multi-tiered fees. A typical example is that a smaller fee would be payable in a non-antitrust context. The most typical one is the failure of a buyer's shareholders to approve a transaction and a transaction in which approval is required of both parties' shareholders. And then a different, usually higher fee may be payable in the antitrust context. More rarely, you might see something called a ticking fee to account for delayed closing risks. This essentially penalizes the buyer by having the consideration payable increase the longer the delay. And of course, termination fees are not always cash-based. In the Facebook WhatsApp deal, Facebook agreed that in the event of an antitrust termination, the termination fee would also include payment to Facebook's shares. And they may not even be a payment at all. In the AT&T Leap Wireless transaction and other telecom type deals, uh, AT&T agreed that in lieu of a cash payment, they would enter into a data roaming agreement with LEAP if the antitrust approval was not obtained. So lastly, you also see closing conditions and termination provisions. In most agreements with antitrust scrutiny, the parties condition the transaction on obtaining antitrust clearance. This prevents either party from having to close a, a transaction only to later found that it is ordered unwound. In many agreements, the failure to meet closing conditions by a certain date, this date is usually referred to as the drop dead date or long stop date, will give rise to one or both parties' rights to terminate the agreement. Often the parties agree that the top date date may be extended by unilaterally if all the other conditions have been met uh, except for the HSR clearance. This prevents transactions from failing where the parties have promptly and diligently fulfill their conditions but are simply waiting for antitrust approval. Again, this is one of these transactions where if you're dealing with a distressed company and time is limited, allowing the HSR clearance to just be unilaterally extended may not be palatable. So I want to talk about, about a bit about bolstering the failing firm and flailing firm defenses, both through the transaction process that a target and seller uses, uh, as well as the purchase agreement itself. Uh, so notwithstanding the fact that the failing and flailing firm can, defense can, if accepted, reduce some of these antitrust risks, many of these risk allocation provisions are still relevant because the defense may not always fit. Uh, but as discussed by, by my colleagues, including Mark, there are actions taken during the deal process that can, that can uh, help its likelihood of success. One of the strongest things that the seller should be doing is building a very strong record. They should be doing this in any event for a variety of corporate law reasons, but it's also helpful in proving with the antitrust authorities what they've done. So the failing firm's board of directors should build a robust record through its minutes that they've been looking at all strategic alternatives that were pursued. They attempted to resolve issues with creditors, for example. They looked into transactions that didn't require a putatively anti-competitive transaction, uh, such as transactions with a non-competitor or restructuring. Make sure the, act, the, the minutes are good and accurate and are taken to show the consideration of these alternatives. They should reflect that the board directed advisors, such as investment bankers, lawyers, and consultants, to pursue and explore these alternatives. They should show the board determined those alternatives were unavailable and unreal, or unrealistic. Make sure that presentations that were given by advisors regarding those alternatives are referenced in the minutes and that the minutes reflect robust discussion and debate by the board. Shopping the target. Now, as Mark mentioned, there may be some flexibility on this given some of the timing concerns of a distressed company, but to the extent that, that, that the time is more flexible, uh, the defense requires that there's no reasonable alternative buyer. And so sellers and buyers, to the extent that they, they have the ability to use the defense, should be mindful about the sales process the target uh, chooses to sell the assets or his business. It's uh, arguing that there's no reasonable alternative buyer is available and that a genuine search was conducted doesn't pass the smell test if you sign a deal with the first buyer that approaches you. And here I'll talk a little bit about price versus antitrust risk and, and remembering that price isn't the end all and be all of the deal process. Even under Revlon scrutiny, in which a board is charged with seeking the highest value reasonably obtainable, the board is allowed to consider relative likelihood of closing, including antitrust risk. 
So the, the board shouldn't necessarily be bound simply because one offer is nominally higher. And they should give very serious consideration to alternative transactions that may take place at a lower nominal valuation, but have a greater likelihood of closing due to reduced risk. You should also take care with exclusivity pre-signing. Exclusivity provisions are typically sought by buyers pre-signing, included in confidentiality, exclusivity agreements, or term sheets. The purpose is to limit the seller's ability to negotiate with third parties, protect the buyer from expending time, resources, and money, negotiating a deal only to find that somebody else won. An exclusivity period that does not permit a seller to conduct a market check or speak with other buyers could be problematic in arguing that a genuine search for an alternative buyer occurred. You should carefully structure deal protections, as was seen in uh, the um, Waste Solutions uh, case. Much like exclusivity provisions, deal protection mechanics serve to protect the buyer and sometimes the seller from a junk deal. They include things like no-shot provisions and terminating rights and related fees. Uh, as you know, state corporate law often limits how tight these provisions can be. And justice courts find that certain deal protection is preclusive and coercive of stockholders and a violation of board's fiduciary duties. So may tight deal protection be found to undercut a failing firm defense of a genuine search or limits on, on alternative buyers. So when negotiating deal protection, be mindful both of your corporate law fiduciary duty requirements and in this context, the requirements of the failing firm defense. And how can this be avoided? Outside of a robust sales process, which is important, if a buyer insists on no-shop deal protection, the seller can seek provisions known as go-shops. These literally permit the target to actively seek out alternatives for a period of time. Make sure that any no-shop includes customary adequate fiduciary outs and the rights of the seller or target to speak to potential counterparties that may offer a superior offer. And remember that when you're defining superior offers to include the ability to look beyond simply price, including the ability to close a deal more easily because of reduced uh, antitrust risk. So remember in the distress context, you're not only seeking to comply with corporate law, reg uh, corporate law regarding your fiduciary duties, but you may also be seeking to comply with the requirements of failing or flailing firm defense. Farrell? Thank you very much, Ryan, and thank you, uh, Mike and, and Dan and Mark, for excellent presentations. Uh, we have some time left. Um, if you have any questions, the people in the audience, now's the time to send them in. While you're doing that or thinking about that, let me pose some questions to the panelists uh, to uh, dig into some of the issues they talked about today. Let me start with a question for uh, Mike and, and Ryan as well. Do parties have the practical ability to appeal a bankruptcy court's 363 sale order after it's entered? Yeah, that's, this is Mike. That That's a great question, Carl. Um, as a practical matter, so the bankruptcy code section 363 contains a specific subsection uh, that says if certain findings are made by the bankruptcy court to the effect that the buyer and the parties acted in good faith, didn't collude, didn't do anything um, untoward in connection with the sale process, that effectively the any appeal that would be prosecuted of the sale order itself is rendered statutorily moot. Now that the phrase, the term statutorily moot is not used in the code, but that's the practical effect of it. So as a practical matter, once the 363 sale order itself is entered, um, it, there likely aren't effective appellate rights in the absence of a stay of the order's effectiveness. And the way that would work is you'd first go ask the bankruptcy court for a stay of the order's effectiveness. And I should add that the bankruptcy rules actually contain a, uh, a provision that, that stays the effectiveness of sale orders, but those, but the protections of those bankruptcy rules are routinely waived in connection with any 363 sale order that's entered for a cause. So um, as a practical matter, once the 363 sale order is entered and the transaction is approved, absent a stay of its effectiveness, it's going to be tough for somebody to challenge it on appeal uh, in the absence of a stay obtained from the bankruptcy court, which is unlikely, right, because it just approved the transaction, um, or from the district court uh, uh, via separate motion on some expedited basis. Thank you. Uh, let me pose a question that many of you are probably thinking. Uh, we're coming out of a pandemic. We're not out of it yet. There's going to be a lot of companies 
arguing after this is over or we're emerging that they are indeed failing companies, flailing companies. Everyone knows the argument will be that everybody's had incredible economic problems. We've suffered with some compared to the Great Depression. Um, and Mark and Dan talked about the attitude of the FTC, the DOJ in the past and, more, and even recently before the pandemic about these defenses, the flailing company and the failing company defenses, a certain skepticism, a certain kind of maybe uh, uh, tiredness to them. We could even say that like everyone raises it. So my question is for Mark and Dan, really a kind of practical nuts and bolts thing, which is how do you think it's best able to convince the FTC and the DOJ coming out of this pandemic that these defenses really are viable defenses. And what would you present to them as a practical matter, the kind of evidence they'd want to see and based on your experience to be convinced that these defenses have legs and hold water to go forward and to help these companies? Um, well, uh, since I don't hear Dan saying anything yet, I'll, I'll go first. This is Mark. Um, so I think Things are going to happen very quickly, and but I think it is it is very important to get your ducks in a row up front, to to provide all of the evidence you think you have available to you relating to the failing firm defense. Remember the the three criteria we were looking at. If you're going to go that route, if you're not going the failing firm route, you're not going to try to do all those criteria then you're going to be delving into competitive issues in the flailing firm defense as we had in, in Boeing McDonnell Douglas. You may have other defenses as well. If, if we could go back to slide 24, this, is the, this was the slide on two refinery acquisitions. Uh, there was a difference between acquisition one and acquisition two. Acquisition two, um, the only argument that I thought I was capable of making was that um, the refinery was just going to shut down. Acquisition one, uh, we were capable of making other arguments as well, and we did. So in that acquisition, there was a question about market definition, and we presented that as well as the fact that the um, that that there was a flailing firm and that it, there was going to be a shutdown. And while I don't know and can't mind read exactly what the FTC decided. There is no uh, public statement on it. I, I think having both those things to argue in acquisition one were important in terms of getting the investigation shut down. So if you've got other arguments, please make them as well. Dan, you have anything to add? Sure. Just quickly, I'll add that I don't think the the rigorous approach taken by the agencies to failing or failing firm will change much currently in the same way it didn't uh, weaken during past recessions. And uh, I do agree with you, Carl, that uh, the DOJ, FTC, and probably the courts will, will likely get uh, failing firm fatigue when everybody's coming to them with, that arg with these arguments. Uh, which to me, I think, makes it important to to follow up on what Mark said, to get your ducks in a row, but also to be prepared to pre to present uh, a case that is um, creative uh, and 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 possibly is you know outside of what the enforcers often hear. Uh, so I think creative lawyering will be uh, will be important going forward. I think it's a great way to end our presentation today. Uh, to all of you, we thank you for calling in. We hope it was helpful to you. This will be recorded. This is being recorded. So if you'd like to see a copy of the recording of the slides, of course, which we're seeing, please let us know. And any questions you have of the panelists, please feel free to reach out. So thank you very much for Baker Hostetler and our antitrust and corporate and bankruptcy teams. Thank you. Have a great day.